Well, how did it all begin? Um, it's a great story. It takes some time to tell. And I'll ask David to interrupt when I've said enough. <laughs> um, we have to go back to 1977. Now, the academic computing industry holds an international conference every three years. In 1977, the conference was in Ottawa, uh, sorry, Toronto, in the August of the year. And I'd been invited to organize a keynote session. Um, when the conference started, there was complete chaos because the day before, the air traffic controllers in Canada had gone on strike. Um, my route to Canada was to fly to Buffalo, get on a coach, be taken to um, Toronto, and eventually I got to my hotel at 5 a.m. Many of the other people um, had much more problems than I did. Um, the conference started. There was, of course, the opening session with all the important people and um, the Prime Minister of Canada giving a talk on, well, I doubt that it was on technology, but never mind. Um, and then the first session um, was a session that I'd organized, and the subject was the future of computing. Um, and I arranged for a spectrum of speakers going from the basic technology up to the most esoteric software. Um, uh, and on the basic technology, I'd invited a man called Dick Petritz to give a talk. Now, Dick actually ran the laboratory in which Jack Kilby produced the first integrated circuit. And subsequently, he had um, become a venture capitalist. He'd started a number of companies, including a major semiconductor company, uh, Mostec. Now, I've been quite impressed by his views about the future of semiconductors. So I'd asked him to come and talk, even though I had never met him. Um, now, I said there was a spectrum. I, 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 I had a go in the middle. And of course, what did I talk about? The future was going to be parallel in computing. And we needed this marvelous device called a transputer. Um, and then at the end of the session, I had who? Edska Dijkstra. Um, and did he talk about software? No. He talked about how disgusting the design of microprocessors were. Um, and the session erupted. I, I, sh I should say this was a plenary session. There were about 5,000 people in the audience. Um, and after the talk, um, people were fighting in the aisles to get to the microphones to express their views as well. Um, and indeed, I, on a couple of times, I actually had to call stewards in to stop fights <laughs> for the microphone. Um, and eventually, it was all over. And I said to the, 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 my fellow speakers, uh, let's go to the bar. Um, and so we went off, and it was dark, mood music playing. Um, and we sat down in a semicircular seat. And I had Dick Petritz beside me. Um, and after a while, he turned to me and he said, how would you like to start a semiconductor company? Now, I'd been 40 hours without sleep. I had had an incredibly stressful time, and I took no notice. And he asked me again, how would you like to start a semiconductor company? And then he asked me a third time. And I didn't say anything. And after a while, I realized that he got up and walked off with his wife. Um, next morning, I thought, well, maybe I'd better do something about that. Um, so I spent the whole of that day trying to find Dick Petritz. Um, and eventually, I found where he was in a hotel, and he actually checked out, and they didn't know where he'd gone. So that was that. 
Right, come the end of the week, um, I'm flying from Toronto to Texas and uh, to Austin. Um, now, you may be not aware, but uh, the arrangement is that the American Passport Control and Customs are actually in Toronto. So if you're flying into America from Canada, um, you can go anywhere without any difficulty. When I went to get board the plane, the passport man said, um, you've got to prove that you have a justification to go to the United States. Then there was some rather heated discussion because Yes, I could prove it, but all my papers were in my case. Where was my case? It was on the plane. And I was having this big argument when who should turn up but Dick Petritz. And he said, I know that guy. Let him on the plane. Um, fine. So I got on, and he was at the front of the plane. I was at the back. After a while, he came up to me and said, uh, maybe we could have a talk sometime. So we arranged to meet in Dallas a week later. And he then, when I met him, he explained that, yes, he wanted to start this new semiconductor company, that he'd got on board uh, what he claimed, and was actually true, was the best memory designer in the business. And how would I like to um, do something about microprocessors? Well. I wasn't actually very enthusiastic. Um, reason being simply, I didn't want to work in America. And after a while, he said, well, um, if you could raise some money in the UK, you could have your part of the company in England. Uh, he said England, not Scotland or Wales. Um, and that was a light bulb moment. Um, why? Well. Um, the, the, at that time, we had a Labour government, um, and it had set up an organisation called the National Enterprise Board, which um, was actually a, the brainchild of Anthony Wedgwood Ben, who was the MP for Bristol, um, and his objective was to. Um, nationalise the commanding heights of industry. The Prime Minister at the time, Jim Callaghan, and the other members of the Cabinet didn't want that. But they did think there was an opportunity for an investment bank, um, provided money by the government, to invest in advanced technology. Um, so it was set up. And I'd actually been asked to um, as a consultant to advise on various things. And the first thing I've been asked to look at was um, the mini computer industry and its rationalization. Um, and fairly rapidly, I came to the conclusion that it was a waste of time because mini computers are going to be obsoleted by the microprocessor. And so I, I wrote this report, which was really quite self-denying um, because if I'd been enthusiastic, I would have probably got the opportunity to uh, actually do the rationalization. I was then asked the same question about the um, telecommunications industry. And again, there were actually structural problems, which meant that it wasn't very attractive. And the third thing I'd been asked about was the um, semiconductor business. Now, at that time, we actually had superb technology. Um, it was in Plessy, it was in Ferranti, in English Electric, and STC. And they were doing really great stuff. But their manufacturing capability was appalling, and they were not competitive in the world market. And there was no hope of rationalizing them because their technologies were all so different. So again, I came up with a negative report. OK, so my light bulb moment was, uh, well, if I went back to the UK and started a company, I could pick up that technology from those companies. Um, I could import the manufacturing technology from the US, a thing that I called a technology pump. And we could create 
the semiconductor business in the UK. Um, so when I came back to the UK, I, on the Monday following, I called the National Enterprise Board, and in a week or so, I went and I, I said, look, I've got this way which maybe we could do something about the semiconductor industry. Uh, and I, I gave some explanation of this to uh, the people I've been dealing with. And within a couple of hours, I was talking to the chairman of the National Enterprise Board, who was called Sir Leslie Murphy. And he listened to my spiel and he said, if you can produce a viable business plan for me, I'll back you. Right, great. Um, there's only one problem, I had to produce a business plan. Now, um, I wasn't an expert in the semiconductor business, so I had to go back to Dick Petritz and say, uh, please, I need a business plan. Now, I couldn't get hold of him. I couldn't make contact. I spent weeks and weeks trying to extract some information from him. Um, and subsequently, I found out the reason why was, firstly, I'd had a problem in dealing with him previously uh, when I was trying to organize this conference. Um, because at that time, he'd been advising the Korean government on how to set up the Korean semiconductor industry. And he was now um, advising IBM on how to set up a semiconductor business for IBM. But eventually, he did send me a business plan, which was the plan that he produced for the, the, the Korean government. <laughs> um, and it wasn't very good. Um, uh, uh, but it did what I needed, which was to provide me with the basic information about the, the scale of investment and the equipment that I needed for the manufacturing process. So I took this and looked at it. Um, and it was actually a plan which called for an investment of $12.5 million. Uh, and I didn't think that was enough. So the first thing I did was just to convert dollars to pounds, 12.5 million pounds. Uh, and that time, the pound was worth a good deal more than $2. Um, then I thought, well, you know, my, my, my experience previously is you don't ask for enough money. So I converted the 12.5 million pounds to 25 million pounds. Now, it's quite easy to do this on a bit of paper, but you actually have to justify the investment. Um, now, Dick Petritz has said, well, the thing you must do to get into the uh, semiconductor industry is you want to read the, the journal called Electronics, which comes out every month. And it was now November, and I got the November edition of Electronics. And on the front cover, there was a picture of this magic new piece of semiconductor equipment called a wafer stepper. Now, I guess you'll all know that uh, the way you make semiconductors is basically color printing. Um, you have the paper is a silicon wafer. Um, you project an image on it, and you uh, then put an ink on, and the inks are various forms of exotic chemicals. Um, now, the way it was, the, the wafers were processed at that time was that a complete image was put onto a wafer um, by a photolithographic machine. Now, a wafer stepper did the same job, but it projected the image multiple times across the wafer. Uh, the reason this was an interesting thing to do was the limiting factor in the, resol uh, the, the image resolution was the optical system. By reducing the field of view, um, you could actually get much higher accuracy. Of course, it wasn't quite as easy as that because you had to move the waiver step by step into an accuracy of about a tenth of a micron. Um, and you then had to also position the image. Um, but it sounded a great idea. But for me, the fundamental thing was that each of these devices cost a million dollars. 
Now, the existing equipment only cost $60,000. And what's more, um, you needed a whole lot more of them because they took longer to do the job. So, problem. So, I had a justification for asking for 25 million pounds. So, this plan went in with wafer steppers. Um, and I actually finished the plan over Christmas uh, while I was playing Monopoly with my children. Uh, uh, and it went to the National Enterprise Board. A couple of weeks later, I was called back, uh, and Leslie Murphy said, look, we think this is great. We want to go with it. But we've got a problem. Oh. Um, we don't think that people ask for enough money. <laughs> so <laughs> can you go back and rewrite the plan for 50 million pounds? <laughs> And that's how we got to that figure. Um, now, it was, it was easy to get through the merchant bankers, but I ha they had to get the approval of the government. Um, and the whole matter was debated endlessly by the cabinet. Um, and one man was adamantly opposed to this proposal. Who was it? Tony Benn the MP for Bristol. Why was he opposed to it? Nothing to do with the technology or anything else. He didn't want to make some Americans rich. Um, and eventually, but because they couldn't get an agreement, uh, the Prime Minister, Jim Callaghan, just said, I'm going to go with this. And he gave his approval. And that happened in August of 1978. So it a year to that point. Um, but it wasn't simple even then. Uh, we'd already had a problem because as soon as the thing got to the politicians, it got out into the press. Um, and there were two issues as far as the press were concerned. Um, who were the mystery people who were setting this company up? Uh, they knew about me, but they didn't know about the Americans. Um, and where was the company going to be located? Um, and we were front page news every few weeks on this. Um, and all the areas of the country were lobbying, you must go and locate with us. Now, I'd already made up my mind. It was fairly straightforward. Um, we were going to have this company. It was going to have operations in the US and in the UK. Um, so the key thing I needed to be was near Heathrow so we could commute backwards and forwards. Um, so that actually meant coming somewhere down the M4 corridor. Um, and in terms of costs of land and buildings and things like that, um, we couldn't afford to get nearer to Heathrow than um, Swindon. Right. So the obvious thing was Bristol. Um, and who lived in Bristol? Tony Wedgwood Ben. Um, right, so that, that was my proposal. And of course, that caused uh, other more huge problems politically. Um, and I, I, I had a situation for eight or nine months in which um, I was being continuously tailed by the press because they wanted to find out where we were going to be located. Um, I'd, I, I, I proposed Bristol and then the government came back and said well you must prove that it's a Bristol and at that moment another fortunate thing happened a report came out about where graduates wanted to live uh, and the answer was that your average graduate thought the best place in the country to live was Cambridge the second best place was Edinburgh. The third place was Bristol. So a report was prepared, went in, and eventually, reluctantly, it was agreed that, yeah, well, probably Bristol should be the place. Um, and meanwhile, I, I couldn't go to Bristol because I was being tailed all the time. Um, but I had an office set up here. Then on 
at the beginning of December, I was told, yes, um, the, the approval process is more or less through, and you can actually go, go, go down to Bristol. But you're not allowed to tell anybody. So I came to Bristol exactly 40 years ago today. It was a filthy, cold, wet day. <laughs> the rain was lashing down. And there's another story, but it takes too long to tell. Um, yeah, you want me to speed up, don't you? <laughs> um, but you have to listen to this. It's good. Um, right. So two days later, I was called at 10 o'clock in the morning. It, 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 it's been approved. You can actually go ahead. Because I was waiting to recruit people. I couldn't recruit without telling them where to live, go. Uh, but we had all the ads and everything ready, so they, they, they were just released. And they, they were to go in the Times, the Financial Times, Telegraph, the Guardian. Um, and it happened. And then at five to six in the evening, I was called by Leslie Murphy saying, ah, we've got a problem. You, you, you can't do anything. And I, and I said, well, but I've already put the ads in the paper. Um, cue consternation. Cue some very rude words. Um, and so he said, right, um, just stay in the office um, and I'll call you back. And I was called back at about 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and he said, right, a D notice, which is the uh, thing which prevents newspapers from publishing, has been placed on this. Um, the newspapers have all withdrawn the advertisement. Quite a lot of them came out with a blank page the next day. And the newspapers that are being printed have all been pulped. That was quite significant, really. <laughs> um, next morning, I was uh, called again by Sir Leslie Murphy, and now there was absolute fury. Um, it was alleged that I sabotaged all this, um, and I didn't understand why. I couldn't understand what was going on. Um, but what had happened was that, yes, all the newspapers have been closed down. But the Guardian, dear old Grauniad, printed papers in London and in Manchester. And in Manchester, they printed three editions. One for Manchester, one for Scotland, and one for the northeast of England. And somehow or other, they didn't pull all of the ads in the northeast of England version. And so it was out in um, Newcastle and all places north and south in the morning. Um, and it was alleged that I'd attempted to sabotage the government and it would cause a great deal of difficulty. And of course this ad said, go west, young man. Well, um, but it had happened and we then started recruiting. From the ad, we got a 1,000 responses. Um, and the company consisted of myself, a director of personnel, an admin manager, and a secretary. It was really quite difficult. Uh, but we went through a selection process, and we got some great people from the companies. Um, and then the second stage of the company was that we needed to recruit new graduates. Um, and so come February, I wrote a letter to all of the vice chancellors of the universities that were relevant and all the relevant departments saying that um, we were setting up this operation. We wanted um, new graduates. And if they would select their two best graduates, um, they could come for interview with Imbos. And they did. And so we created a wonderful company. Now, um, 
Just two things to add to that, if I may. Yes. Um, wafer steppers. Well, the wafer stepper was the way that the semiconductor industry worked. We ordered 24 of them as soon as the finance became available. Um, and what I didn't realize until about three years afterwards was that we had ordered the complete manufacturing capacity for a whole year. And we did it before any of the other semiconductor companies. So we had a year's lead on the whole of the rest of the industry because we use wafer steppers. Second thing is just about the company. I, I prepared this plan, um, and it looked five years out. It looked out to 1984. And in 1984, um, we forecast that, or I forecast, that the company would have a turnover of 120 million pounds. It actually had a turnover of 150 million pounds. Great. Uh, the plan said that we had a profit of 10 million pounds. We had a, actually had a profit of 14 million pounds. And the plan said that at that time, we would be valued at 125 million pounds. And actually, we uh, ended up being valued at 190 million pounds. Now, what the plan said was that at that moment, um, we would say a secondary financing. Uh, we would go public, and with the money, of course, we would reinvest in increased manufacturing capability and reinvest in our technology. Unfortunately, um, Inmos was not the flavor of the month with Margaret Thatcher, who was prime minister by then. Um, and I had great difficulty with this over several years. And when I inquired why this was a private office, they said, well, as far as she's concerned, Inbos is the company that was set up by Tony Benn. <laughs> um, but the consequence of this was that uh, she effectively destroyed the company because we were sold off to um, Thorny MI, who were uh, very well-intentioned, but didn't have a penny in the bank. As a result, we didn't get any additional financing. We weren't able to increase our technology. We weren't able to improve upon our manufacturing facilities. As a result of that, we had to spin out um, various of the bits of our technology. Um, and really, that is why you're all here today. Thank you. <laughs>